All right. Well, for the sake of time, I'm I'm going to go ahead and start with the the intro. And get started with, with our phenomenal and wonderful panelists. All right. So you should, if you, hopefully you're at the right place. This is Stronger Together, a roadmap uh, to an effective homeless system. Um, this is the third webinar. Uh, this will, this one it will be focused on housing problem solving, specifically around diversion and rapid exit. Um, and we, you know, we, I'll talk a little bit more about the series in a, in a, in a, in a few slides. Uh, I'm Josh Johnson, Senior TA Specialist with the National Alliance in Homelessness. I go by he, him, his pronouns, and identify as Black African American, and I'm super excited again to 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 be here um, with you all and just thank you all um, as someone who has uh, worked um, in shelters and doing community-based uh, work I know it's hard to step away some, sometimes so I really appreciate you all being here and we do not take uh, you know you joining us um, lightly so if you aren't familiar with the National Alliance we are a nonprofit organization working to end homelessness and in three um three different ways, right? Through advocacy and policy, through um, data analysis and research, and through capacity building, where uh, which I'm a part of. We do ask that we all um, align ourselves with this, these uh, uh, statements to uh, participation. Um, the, as the Alliance works to ensure diverse and uh, diverse voices are, are welcome, through guests, facilitators, attendees, um, we will not uh, uh, tolerate um, any form of discrimination or abuse. Um, if you do feel, see that um, in, in the chat or in the Q QA box, um, let, it, let us know. And or if we see that, we, you will be removed from this webinar. We do want to create a, 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 a space where we can um, have honest conversation, but we just ask to do that in a respectful um, and non-discriminatory and non-abusive uh, um, language form, because um, as we create to, uh, as we strive to create diverse, inclusive, um, and accepting, brave spaces for everyone to participate in. Again, just another obligatory um, housekeeping slide. Uh, you know, we will we ask you to use the chat. We also, if you have specific questions, we will. Um, ask you to use the Q and A uh, bo box, and we'll have time throughout uh, during our time th together this afternoon to really go through some of those questions. Um, we will have some accompanying documents that we'll send out. We will, of course, have the PowerPoints available and the recording available for you all to uh, see after this this time ends. So, what is this stronger together? Right, uh, we we start every every all the the webinars just having this conversation. We at the Alliance have been have been able to go across the country and work with communities around really strengthening um, systems. And a lot of the things that we were saying, we were saying over and over again to different communities as different parts of, of systems and uh, specifically interventions. You know, we were just talking about how can we work better better together to to overall um, improve our uh, work as a system, right? Um, so with we through our you know through these one off. Uh, contracts or a, con a conversation with communities or through our conference. It, it sometimes it limits who can hear the message of like what what it means to work together. What are some of these best practices? How can we um, improve interventions? So we decided to do a, a webinar series focused on all the interventions that make up make up uh, uh, an effective system. Um, we've done effective shoot outreach, really focusing on housing focused shoot outreach. We our last webinar was really focused on targeted homeless prevention. And this one is focused on housing problem solving, specifically around diversion, rapid exit, as we know, problem solving could be throughout the system, but we're focusing on, you know, the intervention of diversion and, and rapid exit throughout, throughout our, our conversation today. So we also want to under like let, let, have a, some type of a framework or foundation about what we mean by what uh, an effective homeless response system. So effective homeless response system is a system that is effective, efficient, and equitable, and it diverts people when safe and appropriate. And, and when people do fall into homelessness, um, we house people as quickly as possible. We do this by starting with the end in mind to ensure homelessness is rare, brief, and one time, ensure people who are experiencing a housing crisis have immediate access to somewhere to go, 
and, and people are not unsheltered. Uh, people do not spend long periods of time experiencing uh, homelessness and people exit homelessness quickly and, and do not recycle back into homelessness quickly as well. So these are just starting with the end goals. And we also do that by establishing bench benchmarks and we're looking at our data to, are we reducing inflow into homelessness? Are we increasing exits to permanent housing? Decrease, decreasing average lengths of, of, of time homelessness, um, experiencing homelessness, decrease returns to homelessness. And these are those benchmarks that we look at to, to reach that end goal, as, end goal, as I said on the previous slide. So all of our interventions have to work in alignment, right? So no matter what part of the system you are working from, we have to ensure that we are working in lockstep and we have to be housing first. We have to use data to drive decision-making. We have to be coordinated in our efforts. And again, no matter what part, because we all have to work to ensure that we have system flow. We, we like to use this, um, this example of system flow. Um, we all have some type, I'm sure you all have seen uh, roundabouts in your neighborhood that I feel like they're becoming more and more popular. And what, what do we know about a roundabout is, you know, you have to, you have to understand to how, where to enter and where to exit for it to work effectively. It is no different than everything about our system. Each of these, each of these cars is, could be like an intervention. If these interventions do not uh, go in and out properly and create that flow, then it creates a bottleneck and, and, and a disruption for the entire system. Have you ever been on a roundabout and like you're waiting behind this car who's like not not going? So what does that mean? You look back and there's five or six cars behind you, right? And what what that what that leads to is congestion. We're not all working in alignment. So if not all parts of the system are working to uh, move people from homelessness and housing quickly, it really disrupts other aspects of the system. So think about how we make it, how we invest, what how our resources work together. You know, there's some wonderful communities across this country who have great interventions, but if they do not work in alignment, then they're just great pieces in the in a system that aren't really moving the needle, right? So how do we think about the, our wonderful interventions and working together? We I like to use this as a diagram. You have all these moving pieces, but they know where they're going and they're working in together to get to get to where we need to go. So how do we look at think about our resources, our interventions, and ensuring that they're all working? in alignment to so making homelessness rare, brief, and again, one time. All right, so enough of me talking. Um, it's, it's, it's the time to, to um, pass it on to our wonderful panelists who's gonna really talk about housing problem solving and you know how this how this has worked in, in you know in their community. Uh, I'm gonna we have a great moderator, Edward Boyd, um, the founder of the listening group, who's going to take it on from, from here. Well, Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Um, we're so happy that uh, so many people are able to join us, and we encourage people to use the uh, the Q and A, and um, the National Alliance staff will be monitoring that and letting us know. So, thanks everyone for being here. So, I think of housing problem solving as two things. I think most importantly, it's an approach, trauma informed human-centered, equity-based, strength-based approach of working with people in a housing crisis. And secondly, we're focusing on the front door. So we certainly have examples of using successfully housing problem solving for people that have experienced longer time homelessness, but we recognize that if we're going to end the homelessness crisis, we really need to stop people from coming in and help them connect to their own natural resources understand their strengths, provide an empathetic, strength-based, trauma-informed um, interaction with them. And so we think about the three components of the point in time of, of prevention, but what we're really focused on today is diversion and rapid exit. So sometimes different communities use these terms a little bit differently. I don't really think that that matters so much as much as thinking about trying to shut the front door and keep people from experiencing the trauma of homelessness in the beginning. Diversion, we think about as I, um, late in rent, I got an eviction notice last month. I went to uh, court last week. I had to leave. I've been staying with my sister. And now my sister says, this is the last night you can stay here. You need to figure it out. And so I show up at a shelter or coordinated entry 
And I say, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. If nowhere else, I'm going to sleep in my car. When a staff person meets with me, listens to my story, and helps me figure out safer alternatives that are in housing other than sleeping in my street in the street or my car, we call that diversion. So in other words, I haven't yet experienced homelessness, but without the intervention, I'll experience homelessness tonight. Rapid exit is once I have experienced literal homelessness, according to HUD, and I think that's an important distinction between Department of Education that looks at doubled up as homeless. We're using the HUD definition. Once I've experienced uh, literal homelessness, then the same intervention, strength-based, trauma-informed, we call that rapid exit because I've already entered the system and we're trying to help me get back into housing. I think an important part of this is sometimes where we help people go next is kind of an interim place, but with the eye on permanent housing. And there's some really good examples of that that we're going to uh, talk about with our panelists. Uh, my background was doing the work in Cleveland. I consider myself a practitioner, although lately I've done more uh, training and consulting around the country. And the reason that that is important is I get to hear the successful things that other communities are doing. And so I get to borrow and steal and hear the things that are working in other communities. And then when I train somewhere else, share with them the kind of things that work. Um, today, I'm really excited that in particular, we have people with lived expertise on the panel that are going to really share their experiences and really what it feels like to be in crisis and what it feels like to be treated um, like a whole human being and to be listened to and understood and supported as we help people uh, figure out a way back into housing. One of the things we think about uh, training staff is we're looking for creative options. But the creative person is not the staff person, it's the client. And so how do we work with people that are in crisis and help them work through the trauma and crisis so that they can begin to recognize their own natural supports and they can begin to get creative. And we wanna work alongside them and partner with them and help them figure out what the best housing is for them and their family. So with that, I want to go ahead and ask the uh, panel to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with Daryl, and then Ali, then Tanisha, and then Brian. And if you could just tell us a little bit, uh, obviously, your name and where you work. Um, and one of the questions that we came up with last week was just any interesting characteristic that you would like to share uh, about yourself. So uh, Daryl, if you could start us off, please. Hello, my name is Daryl Rogers. I'm, um, pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm a housing problem solving trainer, a person with lived experience. Uh, I've been doing this work for about two years now. Um, interesting thing about myself. Uh, uh, I think the most interesting thing about myself is that I'm a single parent of three very rambunctious children. Um, and I'm an avid reader. I love to read. And thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Daryl. And Ali. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Honored to be here among so many communities today. Um, I'm Ali, and I work as um, I work at LASA. So I'm overseeing problem solving implementation on a macro scale across across Los Angeles County. Um, I would say a fun little fact about me that I take a lot of pride in is I've had the opportunity to work in a, um, essentially uh, every every kind of problem solving role in our ecosystem. I had the opportunity to do this work frontline and then as a specialist where I was doing more capacity building and technical assistance for agencies. And now I get to kind of lead us towards that North Star goal and to have been able to help a few other communities lift this work off the ground. So I'm pretty excited to share that. Thank you, Ed. Great, thank you. Hi, Tanisha. Hi. Hi, everybody. We're so grateful that y'all are joining us today. My name is Tanisha Travis. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I identify as a Black mixed race woman. I'm also a person with lived expertise. Um, I am formerly in the role as a Partners with Lived Expertise Coordinator in Sacramento County for the lead agency. I'm also a consultant around housing problem solving training 
equity within the system, um, coordinated entry, governance structure, you name it. I've been kind of all over the place working with various communities. Uh, so one interesting thing about me, um, I'm going to go with the easiest that some of my peers on this call actually know, but I love music and I love to sing. It is therapy. It is so healing. Um, and that's my interesting fact. And anyone that has the opportunity to hear Tanisha, I strongly recommend that. <laughs> uh, Brian, thanks for joining us. Thanks. And my name is Brian Alexander. Uh, my pronouns are he and his. And I identify as a white man. Um, I am a project director at the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness, which serves as the collaborative applicant and COC lead for the North Carolina Balance of State Continuum of Care. Um, and I oversee our eight person team working with communities and providers across our 79 county geographic area, which is mostly rural. Um, I do like Ali, I come from uh, a direct service background um, and have, have held a bunch of roles um, uh, as a direct service provider, executive director, and now get to do uh, the COC lead role. Um, I think maybe something interesting about me is that uh, this was not my first career. I have been doing this for a little over 20 years at this point, but um, I actually have a degree in mechanical engineering and started in uh, mechanical engineering. So I bring a completely different perspective, not necessarily just the social work perspective, but a very logical systems driven perspective with that uh, mechanical engineering training. But super happy to be here with you guys today and to hear all the great work that's happening across the country from our other panelists. So thank you, everyone. Um, I think one of the things that we do in trainings and that we also did today is to ask people to share something personally about themselves. And so when we're doing this in a training, after we do that introduction, I ask the class, so what's the reason that we're sharing, like that, Daryl, that you love to read books or that, Brian, your past is mechanical engineering? And so usually what comes up is, well, we're whole people and we need to sustain ourselves. We're in a stressful uh, career. And what are the things that recharge our batteries, which is absolutely true, right? The other part of that is, what about the people that we've been honored to work alongside? What are their strengths? And what are the things that when they're not in the housing crisis, they get to do? And until we really understand what those things are, I don't think we've really given ourselves an opportunity to listen and to hear and to understand them. Also, that's often where people's connections are. First of all, it's also where they shine, right? And so one of the part of strength-based work with people is to understand when are they at their best? But also when they're at their best, that's often where a lot of their support systems are. And so if we're wanting to kind of help people reignite um, those supports, we really want to understand the things that give them life and, and to, to spend time doing that. Um, yesterday, I was working um, with a uh, community and someone mentioned that they do pottery. And I'm thinking, you know, if your entire session with a client was talking about their hobbies, their interests, their music, or engaging in an activity, and along the way, we discovered where they used to live and what would that look like and what are the barriers to get there. And it looked nothing like sitting behind a desk and talking to people. I'm thinking we're doing exactly the right thing. Now, is it always gonna look like that? No, but at least we wanna kind of be open to the fact that, you know, if we spoke with Daryl for 30 minutes about what books he likes and things like that, I have a feeling we're gonna get a lot further than if I start reading the pages of my like HMIS intake forms or something like that. So we're really wanting to focus on, on that. So um, let me um, ask if, and maybe we'll kind of go in the same order, just people jump in. Um, what, what were the most helpful things in getting started in this work and either kind of lessons learned, things you would do differently, or certainly the things that went well? And I think we'll kind of include that, the interaction between like, when do you start, do you train first, do you start at first and then do training. So uh, whoever would like to kind of jump in. Uh, one of the one of the most helpful things that got me started in this work is actually a personal example of when I was experiencing homelessness. 
I had sat in front of uh, many providers. Um, and just like you said, it was like they had that HMIS handbook open. Um, I happened to be uh, sitting in front of someone who asked me a personal question. What was it that I like to do? Um, and after she did the interview, she called me back in the office and she offered me a few books. Um, going forward, how that touched my life, um, you know, while I was still experiencing homelessness, I always knew where I could go get a book. Uh, fast forward to when I um, successfully came out of experiencing homelessness and started doing this work. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me and meant the most to me um, was connecting with people, um, was finding out what made them happy, what made them feel whole outside of experiencing homelessness. And so when the opportunity was presented to me to do the same, um, I just went with that because I remember the feeling of, you know, um, when things got rough, I knew where I could go get a book. And so that's one of the ways that I connect with the uh, I work with a lot of youth. Um, I work with a lot of people that experience um, um, uh, being incarcerated and things of that nature. So I tried to find things that, uh, you know, and that was that was one of the experiences that I still carry to this day. That human centered person, person, uh, person first, making people feel, you know, um, that this is just an experience and that we you, you can overcome it. Thank you, Daryl. I think that's so powerful to keep in mind as as we start doing this work. I think the other thing that helps in the in the beginning of starting housing problem solving in a community, people always tend to go to the programmatics, right? How are we going to train? How are we going to implement it? How are we going to roll it out? But I think evaluating within the organization and within your peers and colleagues where what your current practice is might not be in alignment with the human-centered piece and start challenging those ideas and shifting culture about the way we talk about people that we're helping um, navigate this experience um, and start changing that. Um, and I think also we get kind of lost in what is di diversion and rapid exit. And while HPS is a conversation that we can utilize at any stage of experiencing homelessness, the goal of housing problem solving and, and the North Star, I would say, is to really prevent people from ever having that traumatic experience. And so I think folks get lost when we do start training and get into deeper interventions and don't stay in that early. What could we have done to help someone not experience their first night of homelessness? And, um, and being creative in those solutions and not being so... Um, in the box or what we've always done. I like to quote that quote, doing the things you've always done, expecting different results is insanity, right? So we need to change our approach and we need to um, be prepared for that change. So I think that was very helpful in getting started even before the programmatic piece. Um, that was really helpful. Right. Th thanks, Tanisha. Brian, would you like to jump in a little bit with um, getting programs started and uh, what was successful, what things you might do differently, that kind of thing? Yeah, I I mean, the first thing that came to mind, especially as a CRC lead, where we're kind of thinking about in a very large geographic area, what do we do? You know, we our CRC is very rural. So, um, you know, we have a lot of small nonprofits, small faith-based organizations, lots of volunteer groups, a lot that just don't have a ton of capacity to do this work. Um, and so, honestly, the thing that can kickstart this is having funding, and that's what kickstarted it for us. We were really lucky to have some funding to get this started. Um, it was not enough funding to do it across all 79 counties. And so we had to make decisions about how we were going to do that. But we decided that we were going to just pilot this and use this as, and we were lucky enough that the money was flexible enough for us to be able to um, figure out how to do this. Um, and uh, Tanisha, I think you're so right that the training piece is, uh, it, it is an essential piece. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about training in a little bit, but um, 
so often we go to the logistics of how do we do this? And we often think about it in a very programmatic sense because now we have this funding and it pairs over here with this program. And so it's like, okay, we're going to start this new program. And that's not what housing problem solving is. It's an approach, as Ed said at the very beginning. You can't see this as a separate program because these are the types of conversations that we should be having in every project, every program, kind of everything that we're doing throughout the system from you know, the initial contact you may have with somebody experiencing unsheltered homelessness on the street, all the way up through permanent supportive housing, which is kind of the high end intervention, because what you really want to try and do is, you know, always talk about what are those support networks? How can you be independent from our programs? How can we get you out of this system that, um, that needs to support so many people? Um, and so you can have these conversations kind of throughout um, the, the longevity of somebody being in the system. And for some folks, that's at the outset where someone, as Ed said, you know, they have uh, just lost the place that they live and they're at your door that night, all the way up to people that have been in the system for, you know, months, years. Um, and it really is about what is that next step and helping to figure out how to do that. I wanted to, uh, to take a minute to look at some of the questions that have come in the Q&A. Um, and one of them was um, how to address the situation that a lot of people have already explored options. And um, to me, I think two things come to mind. One is to recognize the impact that conflict and especially trauma has on people. So these are not my uh, analogies. I borrowed these from other communities, but one of the analogies that I've heard is uh, someone's story is like post-it notes across a board and trauma comes through and blows all pieces of their story off and when we say, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? What brought you in today? They're picking up these post-it notes that are blown all over the place and they're presenting it in the only way that they know how right now to, to share. Or maybe a snow globe or a Rubik's Cube, whatever helps people kind of think about that. And there's a lot of research that shows when people have experienced trauma, it actually has that effect. Um, my background is in mediation and we've looked at something similar when people are in conflict they're in that amygdala fight, flight, freeze, and they're not engaged in the problem solving um, relational part of their mind. Nothing to do with their personality or anything that they've done but because of the trauma or sometimes conflict. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind in terms of like, as we begin to explore options, we're not saying that, oh, you're, you just haven't thought of these or aren't trying hard enough, right? We're recognizing that it's trauma, that's the obstacle that's getting in the way. I think the other part of that is, especially in some communities, there is a tendency for staff to immediately start with, where did you sleep last night? And that is not how we begin a conversation, right? Because people know exactly what's going to follow up. Well, can you go back there? It's like, well, if I had thought of that dummy, I would be there now, right? So that's not the kind of engagement we're looking at. So I think one is that there may be things after we've heard people and paraphrased it back and allowed them to get some more clarity around their own story, that things pop up that they haven't considered lately, or with a small amount of assistance that we often call flex funds, we're able to unlock an option that our client is not able to because they don't have the, the funds for it, right? So I wonder if, um, if anyone could talk a little bit on the panel specifically around your experience, either personally or as a practitioner with someone experiencing trauma and, and what's what's been most impactful for you in terms of that? I, I would like to share a little bit. I think everything that everyone has said is, is so integral to encompassing a you know, a really trauma-informed problem-solving conversation. It's really important that we start with rapport 
And um, I think that if you can build that trust, that uh, kind of to lean into what Ed and Daryl were saying earlier, if you build that trust with the household and you really lean, in, lean into them in a humanistic approach um, and know that these conversations really need to build off of themselves. When someone's coming to your door at first and they're in crisis and they're in that state of mind where, uh, you know, crisis is crisis is like really think about a time when maybe you were in crisis think about a time when maybe you were experiencing your own housing crisis it's not easy to always think about the next step or what to do and as uh, ed said earlier we don't need case managers who are thinking necessarily about that next step or that program fit for the household but really walking alongside folks to see uh, you know when they would be like when they could like how they could really uh use a little bit of support to identify a resolution for themselves. So um, I think when we're working, we're all working with folks who have experienced maybe the biggest crisis they've ever experienced in their lives. And so really making sure that you are building that rapport and building that safe space. And I find that when you allow a client to share, there's going to be a lot of talking and you're not really needing to, to take lead in that conversation, but just walk alongside them and know that this is not going to be a one and done conversation with problem solving. A lot of times these build off of themselves and I had the privilege to work on a, a case recently, which is not necessarily in my scope. And, um, you know, before passing it off to the agency, we had about three months of rapport before we were able to even get to that resolution. And now that household is diverted and staying um, while waiting for a longer term resource with an advocate that they met um, through a networking event. So just really coming at it to build rapport and build that comfortable, safe space. I think, go ahead, Brian, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I, I just wanted to reinforce what Ali said, which is, everything that we do is about relationships. And so, um, and, you know, our system knows how to form relationships, but we, we often do that differently depending on who the audience is, right? If we're doing development, then we're acting in a certain way. And if we're doing community or elected officials, we're doing that in a certain way. And I think we just have to be really mindful of the audience of the people that we are working with. Ed is absolutely correct. When you are going through a traumatic experience, trauma informs how we react to that. And so we as practitioners, folks that are having these kinds of housing problem solving conversations, really need to be mindful of how we connect with folks in those situations. And relationship is key. Building that trust is key. People are not going to share things with us unless we are open to hearing them and they know that we're open to hearing what they have to say and that we value what they have to say in their ideas. Thank you both. I think those were great elevations. One of the things I think too, when we get to this part about really practicing a trauma-informed approach and understanding that the people that we're having these conversations with are often in a very traumatic state and the story is kind of all over the place. I think this is a place where our own biases and judgment often show up in these conversations. Um, and I think it's a good moment when you, when you are listening to someone's story to remember to check yourself about what you might assume about them, about biases that you hold, um, because as they're telling the story, it's hard enough to get out. And I think sometimes when it's disorganized or out of order, the natural assumption is that someone's being dishonest or someone's suffering from substance use disorder or they're having some mental health challenge or something like that. We make these inherent assumptions um, and judgments about folks. So this is a space where I really encourage folks to um just take a step back and, and have some reflective practice as you're going through developing your housing problem solving uh, conversation practice that this is an area where bias and judgment often show up. Along that line, Tanisha, um, and I always misquote this quote, and if it could help me out, it's people don't know how much you know until until they don't care. They don't they they're not they're not going to. How do you say it? They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. With that being said, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? And when you use that linear approach, you know, to the post-it analogy, um, there was something 
that caused uh, someone to experience homelessness. Nine times out of 10, that was pretty dramatic. So in order for me to actually share what the root cause of that is, I have to know that we care, right? I have to know that this is more than just your job. Uh, speaking from experience, um, I sat before many providers and like you said, I don't know if they thought that I was being dishonest. I don't know if they thought that I was on drugs. I don't know what the case was, but I was terrified or didn't trust um, someone enough to even share what the actual cause, of uh, what caused me to be, um, to experience homelessness. And, and what we've learned during housing problem solving training is, um, Usually, when we get that person back to, you know, the the path, the easiest path to get them back to where they want to be is we have to know what that looked like before, right? And so, um, just like uh, we shared in the um, housing problem solving training that we just did, you know, sometimes that looks like um, offering, hey maybe this office is a little too stuffy. Can we take a walk? But that all boils down to systems and management. You know, um, this, 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 this person is not comfortable sitting in here in this office answering this, these questions, you know, if they're, I don't know, it's, but yeah, they're not going to, unless they know you care, you're not going to get a, um, an authentic um, look at what, um, that portion of their lives look like until they really understand that you care more about, you know, them as a person than, um, you know, the eight hours or how many hours it is that it takes to put in for that work day. Yeah. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I wanted to go to, to one of the questions and that was, especially in the beginning, what metrics um, are people using to, to track our success or progress? And I, I appreciate that question for a couple of reasons. One is we have really uh, well built out systems through HMIS around the country. Um, but I like the idea of thinking of starting as often starting small and learning along the way, because you maybe are working in a specific geographic part of your community, or maybe you're focused on a specific population like veterans or seniors or youth. Um, and what can we learn working with that specific population that's going to expand. Um, and I think to me, really simple metrics can be really helpful. And that is how many people that I have conversations with today. And out of those three or five or seven people, how many do I feel, do they feel we have really a handle on perhaps ending their homelessness tonight? Um, another one of the questions was kind of how, how does housing first fit into this when we don't have available units? Well, part of that is to recognize that interim housing, as long as it's safe and appropriate for clients, can be with friends, with family, other people that they've lived with. And to go back to a previous question of like, well, they've already explored those. Why are we bringing them up? Well, if they know that there's a long term housing option, friends or family that let clients stay there previously when there wasn't a long-term housing option are much more likely to entertain um, working with our client going forward because we're going to continue to support them and whether it's shared housing or their own place or some other creative option. Um, so anyway, so to back to the question about like the metrics and kind of starting, I think we just try to track how many people you're seeing. And for a lot of communities, that's a tricky question because we're asking people other than HPS specialists to do housing problem solving. And so if I'm also working the food pantry or if I'm also doing rapid rehousing or doing street outreach, this program really needs the support of managers and directors to say, okay, so when you were doing this work, how many people did you have a conversation around housing with? And Josh, in his introduction, was really clear about we want to be starting at the end. We want to be focused on housing. And that's what HPS is. And so 
if you're doing street outreach, for instance, and you know we gave out hygiene kits or harm reduction packets, but I also met with two or three people specifically around housing, that's kind of the denominator. The numerator is out of those two or three people I met with, how many do I believe we can go and work with them to get immediately back in the housing? So I wanted to kind of um, use that and let, I know, Ali, you've got a really interesting um, success story out of LA and let other people talk on the panel about the, the things that work. And I guess I'm tying this to tracking, right? And that we know that that um, certain approaches and creative approaches in particular that Los Angeles did that are creative uh, have been really helpful. So Ali, would you mind kind of taking this part of the question first? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So I think um, all of us here, how many of us are here? 628 folks. I think all of us here are probably getting that Zaza Zoo from, and our passion is on hearing those stories a bit, you know, like those case by case stories and really working with households. In my position, I get the privilege to kind of see things more in, in through data across LA County. And so to Ed's point, we have created a tracking tool that we use on HMIS. Um, under assessments and, you know, we don't want case managers to use that like a spadat. I mean, we want the spadat to be implemented a little bit differently. We don't want folks to go through and try and use this as an eligibility checklist. Um, the goal is to really have that organic housing problem solving conversation and then to really quickly track that work so that we can see the data and see the numbers of this efficacy, uh, the efficacy of this intervention. So. Some of the successes that I can share that we've had across Los Angeles County from our fantastic case managers and my team who's out there really supporting to drive this work. Um, we have approximately, and all of this is from our tracking tool, um, we have approximately 3,000 housing problem solving outcomes a year in Los Angeles County. I hope that um, when we do our end of fiscal year data, we see a higher number. Um, Within that, I mean, we do have money in LA County to support this intervention, and that is a huge privilege. However, in the family system, we're seeing that folks are still driving um, this approach with the integrity that we we require, which is like to think outside to box outside the box to use the least amount of assistance to support the housing crisis. And so, what we see in the family system is 80% of those families who have been diverted. Um, from the homeless services system, they did not require any funding. That's for literally homeless families. 58% of imminently at risk families who are able to identify a housing problem solving outcome um, do not need any financial assistance either. We do see a little bit of a flip within our individual and Tay population. However, this is still incredibly cost effective. We see on average, I believe, about $2,500 to resolve a housing crisis through problem solving. And I think the last thing I'll share to just kind of entice you to build out a tracking tool so we can, you know, get data from all of different communities and make this a true evidence based practice is that, um, you know, even though we expect folks who are temporarily diverted to return back to the system for a higher level of support, we actually don't see a lot of a lot of those folks ever returning to the system. I don't have a perfect number for you right now, but I know last time we pulled that return to homelessness data between 2019 and 2022, we saw that only 5% of folks who were temporarily diverted actually ever came back to the system. So that means that something worked once they were connected back to that social support and that the case manager maybe provided enough resources or support and that household had um, was able to like really drive that sense of agency to permanently resolve their housing crisis, though we, you know, track that as a temporary diversion. So just want to encourage you all to build those tracking tools. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. We have one for our key partners that we use on Microsoft forms, and that has um, uh, privacy protection. So um, that data is so integral and really look forward to, you know, someday learning the data from all of the continuums that are on this call. Thank you, Ali. I think you, you point to something in terms of, so why do temporary solutions of work. And I think it points to something that Tanisha, you developed a really good tool to help think about. So I hopefully I credit you when I when I share this, but could you share the the Jenga game analogy of all things? And how does that relate to diversion and why would we use that? Because I just thought it was a it's a brilliant uh, kind of visual. Yeah, first of all, the the Jenga concept came to be just so I could wrap my mind around what is housing problem solving and what are we actually trying to achieve? So 
I think about housing problem solving as a Jenga game. And I hope that most people on the call are familiar with the Jenga game, but it's this block game and you pull blocks out until somebody pulls the block that makes the Jenga fall down. Um, and what we learned in doing that game is that Jenga can stay upright with a lot of missing pieces. Um, but it's that one critical piece that an individual pulls out that makes everything fall apart. Similarly, in housing problem solving, we're looking to identify that one Jenga piece that we can help the client re-enter into their life so that they can be stable. And that doesn't mean that it's a picture perfect square like it just came out of the box. That means they could be missing other components, right? But if we can help them get that one piece that they so desperately need, um, they can restabilize and then figure out their path from there because the people that we work with are very capable and experts in their own lives and they're just needing a little bit of assistance from us. Um, and I like to share my personal story about how my housing crisis was resolved because it's a perfect example of a Jenga piece that somebody handed me. Um, and I was street homeless. I was living on the street, a corner of Alice and 14th in Oakland. Um, and there was a lady that used to drive by where I slept. I slept in the storefront because it was set back from the street. So I was protected from wind, rain, et cetera. Um, but she used to drive by me or drop, jog by me every morning. Um, I think she was going to Lake Merritt. Anyways, she would have conversations with me on her way. She would bring me coffee. She would bring me a blanket. She would um, just talk to me like a human being, which is so, so rare because you feel so unseen and people really avoid eye contact with you and all sorts of things. Anyways, in our conversations, she found out that I was waiting to go to Job Corps. I had applied to be on the list. I was 21 at the time. Um, but at that time, and I'm going to tell my age, uh, you had to find a quarter and a payphone to make a call. And Job Corps required you to make a call every day to stay on their waiting list to ensure that you still wanted to be in the program and to show, for, quite frankly, initiative on your part to want to be there. Um, and this lady knew that by having this conversation with me. It wasn't very long thereafter. She came by and dropped me again. This is back in the early days, a pack bell calling card that was loaded with money so that I didn't have to find a quarter every day. And I knew where pay phones were and I could make that call. I don't know if that woman will ever realize that that one very small thing that she did for me allowed me to take control of my own choice and be able to do the thing that I needed to do. And I had a great case manager at Job Corps that really felt for me and advocated for me to get in soon. But had she not done that for me, I don't know what would have happened. And so it's those small things. Sorry, it gets me choked up sometimes. It's those small things that we're trying to help our clients identify what is the small thing that I can help you with that enables you to be able to write your own path in the direction that you so see fit um, and want to move on with your life? So I always use that example and I appreciate the opportunity for sharing. I hope that was helpful. Right. Thanks, Tanisha. And I, I think that goes back to the, the housing first um, idea that if we can just get people back in, like Ali, you're saying, sometimes it's it's temporary. People often figure it out because there are lots and lots of people that are paying way more than 30% of their income to rent ratio, right? That are paying 50, 60, 70% and won't become our clients and won't experience homelessness. So sometimes we're just getting them back to that somewhat wobbly Jenga, as Tanisha is describing, and that allows them to go back to school, to get education, to get a certification, right? Or to deal with health or mental health or other issues they may have that solidifies their housing. So we don't need to think of ourselves as always like there to help them identify a problem and fix it as much as help them talk about stable housing and how do we help them get back there. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat uh, that related to funding. And we recognize that not every community has uh, the same amount of funding or that sometimes funding is earmarked uh, somewhat 
uh, narrowly and maybe doesn't allow us to use it for, for flex funds. But I wonder if you all could talk uh, a little bit about how your communities have creatively used funding and also how much do you think there needs to be, I guess, in, in to, to be able to do it well? Yeah, I started the, the funding conversation, so maybe I should start this. Um, I mean, we were we were lucky enough to get a Bezos Day One Family Fund um, grant, uh, which is five year grant. Um, so it's one point two five million dollars to be able to do that over five years. And we're only doing um, about, I would say, twenty percent of our counties. Um, that money goes really fast, and we have um, some with any, any funding source, and we all know this because I think most of us probably work with federal funding or public funding in some form or fashion, you know, eligibility is really narrow. Um, what you can do with it is really narrow. Um, you know, the Bezos Foundation money has been really great for us because it is super flexible about how we can spend it in some ways, and then it's really narrow in other ways. So you're kind of always in that place of trying to figure out what you can do um, you know, our eligibility is for families. We can work with individuals and they have to be literally homeless. Um, so we're working on diversion and housing problem solving. Once somebody, you know, what I guess Ed's example at the very beginning, which is, you know, they have nowhere to go that night and we're trying to divert them from shelter um, immediately so that they don't come into the system. Um, but I think one of the things that we learned right away, which we didn't think would necessarily be a problem, with the agencies that we were working with was that um, we only had money for financial assistance. There was no money for staffing. And so when you're, and I, you know, I should have known this because I ran an organization. I worked in an organization that was doing direct service. I think so often we are, especially when we get funding, we're thrust into this place of having to make a decision about oh, we have this money and we can spend it, but it doesn't pay for staffing. And so we're trying to fit it into everything else that we do. And I know for us in a rural COC with a very large geographic area, as I mentioned earlier, with a lot of small organizations that are trying to do this with really low capacity, asking them to do one more thing is just you know one thing too much. And so I think this really goes back to why leadership and organizations are particularly important, why management and program folks are, you know, folks that are supervising are so important to really figuring out how to do this because it really does take a mind shift, a philosophy shift, because you can't do everything. And there are some questions that you really need to ask yourself as a leader in an organization, a board of directors in an organization, folks that are making those decisions, which is really around you know, what are we doing that we shouldn't be doing so that we can actually do something that's going to be more impactful? What are we doing that's just less successful than potentially this, this, this a new approach? Um, and it really takes folks that are committed to uh, doing that philosophy shift, really getting the right people in to be able to do that. And really, you know, we talk about um, building on the strengths of the people that we're working with in housing problem solving conversations. And the same thing is also important for our staff that are doing this is that we have to build on their strengths and really understand what their strengths and weaknesses are. Everybody is not attuned to doing this work. They may be really good over here, but they might not be great in front of someone where you need to be creative and flexible. You know, some people just need the checklist of step one, step two, step two, three, four, right? And th that's not what this is. And so I think leadership and management really need to be thinking about that. And, you know, when thinking about funding, how, you know, you can do this without financial assistance. I think, Ali, you mentioned there are households that you're helping without financial assistance, but you really need it. You need both of those pieces. Like we're doing it without the staffing piece, and we struggle. And so we're thinking about how do we build that part? You don't have the financial assistance. I mean, my suggestion, because we have, and I think this is really apparent in rural communities where there aren't as many providers, we have a lot of faith communities, a lot of, uh, you know, philanthropic organizations, 
volunteer organizations, um, church groups, that they're coming across a lot of the folks that we're serving and they're providing, you know, some of these types of funds to them, right? Someone comes in and they're behind on rent and they go to their local church and that church gives them a little money to be able to do that or to pay a utility bill or to get their car fixed. And, you know, build, if you can't, if you don't have that financial assistance, then start building collaborations with those community partners because you have those partners, right? And start talking to them about how, you know, they're spending their money because they are spending that money. And, you know, you all are, ex you have expertise because you're working with this population all the time. Are there ways that you could collaborate together to be able to combine your resources, our staffing resources, your financial resources to be able to do that? Right, Brian, thank you. And you pointed to one of the questions that was in the Q&A, but before we get to that, um, Tanisha, I know you need to, uh, you have a prior commitment. I just wanted to open up the floor before you leave, if there's anything that you wanted to kind of share before uh, that we didn't get to ask you yet. Yeah, I, I did just want to share, Brian, that's such an important point that you raise about really knowing your community resources and having a collaborative approach of working together. Um, what we find in communities across the country is we'll get providers in the room and they don't even know what each other does. They don't know what programs they run, what eligibility requirements are, et cetera. And so if you're in a position where you don't have a lot of funding, maybe work on building a community resource for all of your providers that really walks out what their programs are, what their eligibility requirements are, um, including folks that may not be a part of your HMIS system, the grassroots orgs that are not really engaged. You know, do the due diligence on building a resource for providers to go to and look at and exhaust all of those other possibilities that already exist in the community, which is a good practice anyways, because you really want your housing problem solving funds to capture those or to get to those in your system who are the most vulnerable and not served by any other resource within the system so that you're making, you're getting the best bang for the dollar because you are really helping people that are underserved in every other area of your community. What we find here in Sacramento is often it's folks who are working just enough that they can't get assistance and just little enough or receiving payment little enough that they also can't sustain. And so there's this in between where you're just not eligible for anything or any assistance or any program. Um, and so we find that those folks really benefit from this and they are some of the most vulnerable because of the lack of programs that service them. So um, I'm just grateful to be here. I think everybody that is in this work somewhere inside you, there is a reason why you're here. Um, and there is a why for you. And I just encourage folks to lean into that why. And remember that we are all in this country for the most part, unless you're extremely rich, we are one crisis away from experiencing homelessness ourselves. Um, and so when we're sitting across from folks that are coming to us to have these creative conversations, remember that it could very easily be us or someone we love. Um, and that we are just here to partner with them. We don't hold any power over them. We are not I'm better than you. I could easily be in your position and um, and just be of a support. So that's all I really wanted to share. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Tanisha. For being Tanisha, here. before you leave, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I just truly admire you. And I felt like I couldn't move on without letting you know that was my first time hearing your story and um, just admire you so much. Look forward to talking to you soon. <laughs> thank you so much, Allie. You're awesome. All the panelists are awesome. Everybody is. Thank you so much. Um, so, Brian, you were touching on a couple of things when we were asking about funding, and you mentioned when agencies or communities have flex funds or housing funds. By the way, let me clarify, when we say flex funds, we often mean um, money that isn't earmarked for back rent or future month's rent, but can be used in, in a wide variety of ways. But you said that sometimes the problem is that there might be assistance funds, but not staffing funds. And so that uh, leads me to one of the questions in the Q&A, and that has to do with staff support uh, from leadership. I think, Trinae, you, you asked that. I think that's such a good question. Um, the National Alliance, along with some other organizations, has information on a recent survey that they did on, on staff needs. And shockingly, we're in a stressful field, and people are not paid well enough, right? And so it's, and even if people have, 
Um, PTO, one of the results of, of the National Alliance of Survey was that people aren't able to use uh, their PTO. So that's a really um, significant barrier, right, to being able to work with people that are experiencing trauma and help them get creative and support them and, and returning to housing. So um, to me, one of the most important things is just for leadership to have those conversations. And I really put uh, the focus on executive directors, CEOs, to begin to have those conversations and to look at examples for what works around the country. Um, one of the things that I the bell I've been ringing in, ringing is I don't think working with people experiencing trauma is entry level work. I don't think that's trauma, and so I and think so it's often it is Ed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we depend on that because we don't pay well enough in our system to be able to afford folks that have that, you know, that are not going to be entry level. You're so right about that. And so that's to me, the impetus, in my opinion, is on leadership to put the halts to that and to say, um, and, and whether they get pilot grants from foundations or just look towards having people that have experience in this, that also have leadership work. For some reason, our field is one of the only fields where as soon as you're good working with the end consumer, in order for you to make more money, we pull you away from who we're there to work with. That's not true in medicine or other types of healthcare or education or sales. If you're an excellent salesperson, you might supervise a team, but you're working with people that are actually generating money for your organization, a realty company. Well, we're here to end homelessness. If we have staff that are really good working with clients, we need to figure out ways to support them so they can continue to move up through the organization and make more money, not just a like the minimum like living wage, but actually where they can continue to do the work. And so how we reimagine our teams and support each other, and that comes back to tracking. It is absolutely my opinion that we will see more effective work when we slow down activities and focus on outcomes. And that's really leadership's job is to figure that out and not just throw new staff with like in a huge am uh, amount of new cases and expect people to be trauma informed and creative and, and everything else that we're doing. So um, I just kind of want to throw that out there. Um, uh, Ali or Brian or Daryl, I don't know if any of you want to kind of jump in and talk about like ways that you see, see staff that are really successful. How have they been supported? What are ways that leadership has been able to do that? Um, I would actually, you know, that's one of the things that we hammer home um, here in this CLC um, with the housing problem training. One is um, expressing and 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 getting uh, providers to understand that this work isn't for everyone. Um, and that's OK if, you know, um, we've actually had providers say that, hey, they actually don't like um, assessing um, clients um, for fear of taking something home, um, you know, to, to their homes. Um, and we also encourage the same thing that you were just speaking of. We encourage them doing uh, and finding that space that they, that they suggest to the clients, finding something that they enjoy to, um, doing, um, finding those, you know, those things that they enjoy that relieve stress so that they are able to come to work and better serve clients. Um, uh, the other thing that I want to speak on was, um, you know, here out of our housing problem solving training, they've actually formulated a frontline collaborative to find, um, to sit in the rooms with other providers and find out exactly, you know, what other people that are doing this work do and, and, and uh, connecting with them outside of, uh, you know, or for the betterment of the client. So I really do believe that that is um, key. I mean, I found that, you know, having run an organization where we didn't have a ton of turnover um, and not having nearly enough money to pay people for their expertise and how much they were doing, um, we, you know, the organization that I worked with, 
really, we worked with the hardest of the hard, uh, you know, folks in our community that no one else would touch that weren't even allowed to go into the DSS li uh, lobby because they had been thrown out and banned from going to the Department of Social Services. And um, when you're working on that day to day, you, 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 you're going to burn out if you don't have the support. And so I think that one of the things that we felt was really important, especially since we couldn't necessarily pay them at the level that we would like to, was to build um, a culture where it felt like uh, everybody on the staff had your back, right? So, you know, we uh, were really intentional about building relationships amongst the staff that were incredibly supportive um, and uh, held grace for one another um, and gave people the opportunity that if that day just wasn't working for them, they could take that day off and have a mental health break. Or, you know, if they were working in a day center, then they, you know, uh, they were taken off the floor, right? They were, they, they did desk work for that day because they were a little crispy because they had been doing too much for too long with a lot of really hard uh, cases. Um, and trying to find, you know, we didn't have a lot of extra money for, um, bonuses or hazard pay or, you know, any of those sorts of things is going back to what I said earlier about your, your, your collaborative partners and those folks that they want to give something and they might not always have like uh, money to give, but, you know, w things that we used to do, we would bring in people and they would do, you know, massages and they would do, um, you know, some different kinds of care things that, you know, we didn't necessarily had, have to pay for, but it was something for the community to be able to give back. And so I think, you know, we're talking about creativity and the way that we're approaching our clients. And I think we have to do the same thing because we don't always have those resources. Money is great. Vacation is great, um, but you don't always have the money to give. And sometimes you just don't have enough staff to give people as much vacation as, as you want to. Um, but I will say that even at that, we encourage people to take their vacation always. So supervisors were absolutely essential in that to say, nope, you need to take vacation. Let's talk about what your vacation is. And it was an environment and, and a culture in which we were like, you, you know, you get this, you need this, we want to support you in doing this. Um, and I think that goes a long, long way, especially when you can't pay people as much as they're worth. Thank you, um, Brian. Someone in the chat put that um, one organization that they're familiar with um, allows sabbatical. And so that's another way to think about that. We see that in education or in ministry sometimes. And one of the questions that was elevated is, um, let me kind of read it here. Um, how do you create buy-in for housing problem solving slash diversion before coordinated assessment? And sometimes there, and I think when we see that there's resistance or pushback from people about to experience homelessness, what are the best ways to, to, to handle that? Um, I think that, well, first, just to not miss out on this conversation, absolutely, yes, 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 and yes, if people in this industry need to get paid more, especially our case managers who are taking on this work. Um, and uh, when integrating housing problem solving, these conversations are not, I just wanted to go back to that for a second, these conversations are not easy. They do take a lot of time. So if you are in a leadership position at an agency and you're having your the folks on your teams have these conversations, um, I think, you know, just knowing this isn't a clear the lobby mentality. And so really making sure there's time if possible between households so you can try and limit and reduce that vicarious trauma and that compounding of folks just having to take on case after case after case because it, it, these are not these are these are, are not very fast conversations typically maybe 30 minutes 45 minutes really to build that rapport with the household um, and sorry Ed for going back but to go to your question now on creating buy-in I think um, a lot of this a lot of the why is is um, 
already within our frustrations within our coordinated entry system right there's not enough uh, there's not enough uh resource for the crisis at hand not everyone's going to have access to a program there's huge wait lists um and there's a lack of affordable housing i know in la county and i'm sure in every single county that is on this call i'm sure we all feel it and so um just really making sure that folks know that this is the trauma-informed approach to really lead with when we are facing the barriers that we are while trying to get everyone into housing so i think we find in la county that uh, creating buy-in for having these conversations is really just leaning into what our frustrations are with the coordinated entry system and how we can continue to house people and rehouse people um, while we're working with all of the barriers our system has I think it's an iterative process, Ed, right? I mean, it's like anything else that we're trying to build by and for that I think that a lot of us are doing every single day, which is, will you use HMIS? No, will you use HMIS? No, right? It's just continuing to have the conversation and figuring out, and it's it's kind of like what we do with, with our clients too. It's right, it's trying to figure out what it is that they need and listening to what, what, um, what it is that they're challenged with. Ali, I think you're, you're, you know, you're so right. It's like people know what the problems are and they complain about the problems and they're challenged by all these things that are happening in our system. And if you can bring a solution to that or an approach to that, that could solve some of that, um, then, then suddenly you start to see the light go off in people's eyes. But, you know, it's going to be different for every person or every organization or community member that you approach. And it is an iterative process. It's just going to take a long time for some uh, people and agencies to get on board with, um, with doing these types of approaches. Um, and if you can get, you know, I always find that if you can find a champion in a community or in an organization then and they start doing it and it's their peers i mean for us you know we're because we're the coc oftentimes it's like oh it's the top down coming in to tell us what we need to do and that doesn't go very well so you can be really strategic about finding that champion in a community or an organization that you have rapport with maybe that really gets it and then they can start talking to their peers at other organizations or folks that are in the community that have decision making power and that really really starts to help you get buy in because then funding things can help you know if there's a funder that's bought into it or if you know, an elected official says, oh, this is something that we need to do. Um, or it's just somebody that they admire, right? That um, that says, oh, this is something that we need to be thinking about. Maybe that turns the corner, um, but it's just continuing to have the conversation and finding those champions in communities and organizations. To response to one of the questions I, I read, it had something to do when when clients themselves are are resistant, and I think one thing for us to keep in mind is that sometimes they've experienced trauma from the homeless response system itself, and for us not to take that personally. And so um, I remember a woman that came into the office, not in the shelter where, where I was working, and said, "I had a terrible experience with your staff." I don't know that it was actually our staff that were there. Like it could have been other shelter staff or another agency. It didn't matter. My job at that point was to listen to her and her experience. And she was yelling and that's okay. Like people are upset. There's trauma, right? That's why we need people that are trained and that have their batteries recharged right, and take their vacation is so that we can be there to work with people. You know, trauma-informed care isn't just there for when people are sad or a little bit upset, right? We want to continue that trauma-informed response to people that are really pissed off because they've been burned by the system and to listen and to understand. And pretty soon we notice that once they've been heard and I'm not defensive, I'm understanding the frustration, then we can move to a conversation about, well, did we help you with housing? Would you like to spend some more time talking about 
how we can help you and your family stay housed or get rehoused, et cetera, right? And so I think that that some of um, the pushback or resistance that we may get from clients means they need to be heard more and understood more. And to do that, staff need to feel safe at their work and we need to have processes and procedures in place so that we don't, and training, so that we don't immediately equate anger with violence. And so that we can be there for people. And we know that that anger to violence, there's a lot of racial uh, undertones to that and to make sure that we're not playing into that and to listen to people and to have the skills to notice that there's a difference between a threat and frustration and to really help understand and validate people's concerns and sometimes it feels like it's a long conversation and then you look at the clock and it was 15 minutes and now we can move on to actually having a productive conversation about ending their homelessness, re them with their supports and helping them figure out ways to, to re-engage. But they feel heard. I mean, I think that's the most important thing, right? Because once they get, once they feel heard, then you can actually move on from, from that space. Um, and I think you you make an important point, Ed. I think with with staff need to be trained, right? What do you do when someone comes in and they're screaming and yelling at you? Because I think you know we also have that uh, that flight uh, mechanism in our brain that says I need to get the hell out of here as soon as I can because I don't feel safe. Um, and so, really well trained staff, uh, you know it makes a huge difference to know how to deal in those situations. Um, and I think one of the things that we have done and, you know, with, with the work that we've done in housing problem solving and working with staff and community folks who are starting to implement these things is, yeah, you need to give kind of the overall uh, aspects of housing problem solving kind of webinars like this or talking about the, you know, the the basic framework of what housing problem solving and diversion and rabbit exit are so that folks know what the approach actually is and how to implement it. But it makes such a huge difference, right? I think this is often where we we kind of mess up with 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 uh, the work that we do, which is we do the basics, but we don't do the advanced, right? After that initial webinar, we expect, oh, well, you know what it is, go out and do it. And one of the things that we've done, which I think has been really helpful, is we did all that basic stuff. We do that every, we've done that every single year as we start the new year, um, building on the basics, of course, because we have the similar, you know, the same people that are, do, or the same agencies that are doing it if we have some new staff. But I think it's the ongoing coaching. Like we're doing bi-monthly coaching with them um, so that uh, we're bringing all of our folks together that are that are doing that. Um, and they have the opportunity not only to work with the person who trained them, but they also have the opportunity for peer sharing. You know, I have this case or I had this happen what did you do? Or have you had this happen before? I think that makes such a huge difference, especially creating that supportive environment of I'm not the only one going through this. I've experienced similar things too. And you have other folks to kind of bounce ideas off of. And it's that ongoing training and technical assistance and support that I think really makes a difference for continuing that buy-in and learning. So Brian, I don't know if you're reading the chat along with me, but that was my next question. Uh, Josh kind of pointed out like how um, is what type of trainings would be helpful for organizations to be successful? Um, uh, this is largely what I do, uh, but I know other people do as well. But um, I really think that having the training be interactive and practice-based is, is really important um, so that when people that have been doing it for a while are trying new skills, they're trying it in a, in a workshop format, not necessarily with someone currently experiencing homelessness, and also that there's a continuation in the training and that we, and that's what we call in uh, mediation um, uh, or reflective practice, right? So recognizing that, oh, I'm, I know a lot about our community's work with veterans, I don't know so much about people that are undocumented or I've done a lot of work with LGBTQ, but not with the foster care system. And there's a lot of important interactions there. So I think self-awareness 
and um, and recognizing that training is ongoing is really important. But I just wanted to throw that out to uh, to the other people. If you could talk a little bit about um, what's been most helpful with training and suggestions you would have. I love this One question. Oh, go, Daryl. Yes, go for it, Daryl. You go ahead. You go ahead. I'll go next. I would love for you to go, Daryl. Go for it. I was just going to say the same thing over again about um, that's really one of the things that I'm really proud of um, that has came out of the housing problem solving trainings here in Sacramento was the collaborative, uh, the frontline collaborative for different providers, um, because you have providers, like you said, that work with, you know, very diverse demographics that have uh, their own sorts of issues and problems. And, you know, that... Um, that interactive sharing that, you know, um, we have, we have a, a session, uh, a section here, the training here, where we actually uh, try to make, we have a scenario where the client is just really facing difficult circumstances and maybe uh, appearing as difficult where, where trauma is showing up. So, you know, that collaborate, you know, having those collaboratives are, 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 I think are a huge part of um, this topic right here. Yeah, I love that, Daryl. And I also love what Brian was sharing about like the ongoing training. Uh, training is such a key piece of really having a quality housing problem solving conversation. Um, I think we started training in LA County in October of 2019, and now we are here, what is that, four and a half years later, I believe, and training is still a huge piece of what we do. Um, and so while this intervention is a lot about, you know, building that rapport, as we discussed earlier, having those exploratory, you know, very organic conversations, there are key skills that are really integral for people to have a little bit of expertise on so that we can increase those housing problem solving outcomes whenever possible. Um, and things that we're not even taught necessarily in, you know, an MSW program or if you're going through school. So um, I think uh, some of the things that we like to do in LA County is we have, you know, trainings on how to have the problem solving conversation. As Ed said, we make our trainings incredibly fun. They're very vibrant. We play music, we play games, we have a lot of activities. We do in-person practice labs, role plays. Um, just really make it a very exciting environment and um, but on top of that we have segments of trainings where we do conflict mediation or in pro progressive engagement um, reality testing negotiations all of these things that might not necessarily come incredibly naturally so we can make sure that we are you know in a really restorative way trying to connect folks back to family and friends when bridges might have been burnt and so um, and really making sure we're setting up those realistic expectations so I think training is a really important part of what we do in, in embedding housing problem solving into our work. Um, we also have some system implementation trainings just because, as Ed mentioned earlier, getting leadership really involved, making sure agencies understand is so integral um, to like the foundation of making sure problem solving can thrive as an intervention. And so, um, yeah, training is just important. And I just want to emphasize what Brian shared, which is it's not a one and done, just like these conversations, you have to often retrain refreshers. And I, I see myself as like an ongoing forever student of this intervention so that we can always, uh, you know, make sure we're up to date and having the best, most trauma informed practices as embedding this. Um, in LA County, we, my, my team rather trains about 1200 to 1800 folks a year, and that's case managers as well as key partners, because we make sure that we're training elected office staff, uh, faith based organizations, small nonprofits, um, you know, folks further upstream who are also touching folks in housing crisis, so that we can, you know, help folks to, to avoid the system altogether, if, if possible, and I will say. Uh, we do see a lot of, because unlearning is a part of this intervention, a lot of folks have been in this industry for a long time and, you know, are not interested in doing business differently or it's a little more challenging to shift how they do business. So um, I do see that we get a lot of our very creative intervention um, outcomes through some of our key partners who maybe aren't as unlearning as much. Uh, the last thing I'll say about training is uh, for folks out there is when you're doing onboarding and you have someone new to the system, key point to really get them embedded into housing problem solving. I think I have an easy time with this intervention because I was introduced to the system with diversion 
back in 2018, um, working at an agency frontline. And so I think I didn't have to go through that on learning. So in your onboarding process, really embedding how to implement this intervention and have problem solving conversations wherever you are in the system, whether that's at the front door or as an, in, uh, inter, an intake specialist or an interim housing case manager, working in, um, you know, even as a housing navigation staff, it's really important that all folks who are really coming into the system for the first time and all folks in every facet of our system are trained on this intervention and um, allowing them to have opportunities to continue to increase their expertise is integral. Ali, thank you. That was so well said. Um, we, we need to turn things back over to Josh. I want to say I know that there were some questions we didn't get to answer. I apologize. I also saw a lot of great stuff in the chat in terms of references and uh, training links and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I just want to say thank you, everyone, for, for, for the great questions. And I apologize we couldn't get uh, we couldn't answer all of them. Josh. Thank you so much, Ed, and, and this wonderful panel. Um, before I close this out, I wanted, I want you all to to give some kudos to our wonderful panelists. Put your favorite emoji in there. Just, I, I'm feeling so excited based off of off of that experience. So many different jewels and gems were dropped through all the, through the great conversation that Ed facilitated. Um, you know, shout out to Tanisha who had to jump off. Um, but yes, uh, I'm going to close this out here. Um, again, thank you to our wonderful presenters I, on the final slide. And we'll again, send this out to you all. They'll have everybody's contact information. So, um, we'll, we'll close it out there. Let me share my screen really quick. All right. So just, just a high level overview of some of the, the great topics that were already talked about housing pro problem solving can be throughout the system, right? This doesn't have to be tied to diversion, even though it's a core component of diversion and rapid exit, everyone in or around the system can use housing problem solving by using open-ended questions, deep and active non-judgmental listening, um, uh, have utilizing em empathetic person-centered approach, um, you know, by by you having pr uh, partnerships that are centered in equity and client choice, um, and then uh, utilizing parallel short and long-term planning with a creative menu of options. And that this these are all things taken by the HUD's um, homeless system response and housing problem solving that we'll throw in the chat. Um, but that's the larger uh, thing of housing problem solving. And just to ensure that diversion is successful, right? Here, just a key overview. And just understanding that diversion is not a program, right? It's 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 a philosophy. It's 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 how it should be embedded in our, our front door, our access point. Um, it's a conversation, not a tool. It involves a continuous and system-wide training, as was, as was just mentioned. It needs to be streamlined with cross-system communication and conversations should be building upon each other. We need to utilize progressive engagement uh, with the resources that we have and interventions. Um, as, as Brian mentioned, you know, resources can run out uh, really quickly. Um, so do not, you don't want to lead conversation with all, the, all of the resources that we have. Um, we want to have that, that cross collaboration identified upstream partnership resources are crucial because sometimes we can help folks in, in their uh, potential housing crisis by just connecting them to upstream resources. And then at the Alliance, we kind of uh, talk about the four C's of diversion, which is community wide buy in, problem solving conversation, creating connections, and continuous practice. Um, these are just the overview, of, and they are all woven out through, woven throughout our, our time this, this uh, afternoon. And again, thank you all for joining us. Here's the here's the great our great speakers' um, email addresses. They'll be sent out to you all. If you have questions uh, related to the series and future uh, topics, reach out to me. Um, the link to the roundtable to sign up for our next one, which will be coordinated entry. Um, feel free to to jump there. And again, last but not least, a may a big huge thank you again to our our phenomenal speakers. And again, here is their contact information. And this will be recorded so you can watch for future use. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day.